Hi, I'm Kim Romney. In the literature, I go by A. Kimball, and uh, I got my PhD at uh, Harvard back in the early 50s. In those days, uh, they had an interdisciplinary department that was sociology, anthropology, and uh, psychology. So ever since then, I've been mainly an anthropologist and cognitive scientist. One of the things that I did early on as part of my training was to be sent to a remote village in Oaxaca. Uh, it was in the mountains of Oaxaca and it was called Huslawaka, a widely unknown little Mixtec Indian village. And we spent a year there and uh, I had my wife and by that time I had two kids. And when I got back, and wrote uh, the book that we call it an ethnography, uh, I realized that if you picked an ordinary person off the street, or let's say uh, a newspaper reporter, that they probably could have written an equally good book. And that was a little disappointing to me because here I was supposed to have a Harvard PhD and know something. And I decided to dedicate my life to understanding and developing methods to study cognitive anthropology. Now, what do we mean by cognitive anthropology? Well, it turns out that each individual knows a very, very great deal about their culture. And uh, an example of culture and probably the prototype to think about it is the language that you speak. In other words, a culture contains many things like language, beliefs about illness, all kinds of emotional attitudes, etc., cetera, et cetera. But what culture is, is really shared cognitive patterns. And by cognitive patterns, we mean that the knowledge is in the head of individuals, but individuals share those uh, patterns. So that in order to speak English as part of the heritage of English speaking people say in the United States in the middle class culture, uh, we have to agree on what the meanings are of different words. And so I dedicated my life to developing methods for objectively studying what these shared cognitive patterns are. And uh, the first 10 years <clears throat> of my career, uh, basically I spent learning how to learn. And that was an exciting period uh, at Stanford University in collaboration with people like Roy Dondrati, who went on to write the definitive book, I would say, in cognitive anthropology. And we collaborated in a 1964 conference that summarized in a special issue of the American Anthropologist what was then known about cognitive anthropology. <laughs> and it was uh, sort of scary in how little we knew. But then I went into developing and learning from other fields about methods of collecting objective data and multidimensional scaling was uh, w one of the first tasks. And uh, it I took about 10 years, and when I first got to Irvine about 45 years ago, uh, we had a conference and in collaboration <clears throat> with Sally Nirlov and uh, Roger Shepard, we had a conference down at the Balboa Bay Club and collected the world specialists on multidimensional scaling. And in 1972, we published two volumes summarizing that work. Now, what do we mean by uh, multidimensional scaling? It's simply an objective way to collect data on how people see similarity among objects. For example, take the domain of animals. 
we all share an understanding of what different animals look like. And for example, if we use the word elephant, uh, we get a co an image in our mind. We have a cognitive representation of what an elephant is. And we have a cognitive representation of how each animal is similar or different than other animals. So, that, for example, we all know that a monkey and an elephant and a gorilla are more similar to each other than they are, say, to an elephant or to a mouse. So what we do in, in multidimensional scaling is collect judge similarity among the animal terms, for example, and that gives us a picture of how similar each individual sees the animals. And when we superimpose how one individual sees it and another individual, there'll be a little bit of individual variation, but by and large they're very, very similar so that uh, w we then develop methods for comparing different cultures. And we collected, for example, how people see emotions and how similar different emotions are in Chinese and in Japanese and in English. And lo and behold, by and large, we have the same similarity structure among uh, different kinds of emotions and the methods that we develop allow us to measure how much everyone shares and how much individual differences there are and the differences between cultures. But for example on uh, the domain of color for example, there's a question of whether people in different cultures would organize the culture, uh, colors in the same way. And we did that in the same languages like Chinese and, and uh, Japanese and English. And what we found is that there's less than 1% difference in the average way that the average person in China would do it from the way we do it in English. And unexpectedly, we could even measure that there were individual differences in both China and, and the U.S. and that for sometimes you'll see people argue whether is that a blue or a green or something like that. Uh, our methods were fine enough to measure that. And uh, finally I might say that after developing those methods I collaborated here at Irvine uh, beginning in the mid-80s, developing what we call culture consensus theory, and that was with Batchelder, uh, William Batchelder and uh, uh, Susan Weller. Uh, and the consensus theory, we published a famous article in 1986 in the American Anthropologist that turns out to be a very useful method of measuring the extent that people know their culture and in different domains. And that article has been the most cited article in the American Anthropologist since 1970. And we're very proud of that. And that method is also can be used in conjunction with multidimensional scaling because it gives us more fine-grained measures. For example, to collect uh, how similar one term is to another in these different domains, uh, it, it gives us really quite good measuring instruments for measuring actually how people uh, agree with each other. And uh, one can sort of understand that in a common sense way. For example, Imagine that you're throwing, that several people are throwing darts at a dartboard. After the dartboard has been used, you'll notice that despite the fact that the bullseye is the most difficult part to hit, that that's where the cluster, the, 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 the places that the dart landed are closer together. So if you think of throwing a dart at a, at a target as 
a test of what you know about how to throw to hit the bullseye, those who are best are near the middle, and that's the densest. Now from that, we developed what we call the, uh, the fried egg pattern. And that is the people that were the best shots, their shots landed closer to each other. And those that were poor shots landed off. Now, if you think about that, we applied it to an article that we published uh, in Psychometric called Test Theory Without an Answer Key. Because if you take an objective test, uh, the, the method enables you from the answers to determine what the correct answer is and how good each student is, how much competence they have in that. So that in theory, if you had a class of 50 students and did an objective test, and you were a research assistant and uh, you were given the answer key, but you lost it, but you were given the answers, it turns out that you can correct them just as accurately as if you had the answer key. And this works on small numbers of people. So this is a very widely used method. So I'd say in summary is what, uh, it's hard to say there's a specific discovery What the attempt is over my career has been to develop methods that a professional can use and get much more objective and precise data than if you're untrained. So that unlike when I first got my PhD, I couldn't tell myself from a journalist, now I can get answers that I'm willing to bet are far better and far more objective about the study of culture.